You have to get past the parts that I don't read. There we go. Today's gospel is from Mark 6, 30 through 34 and 53 through 56. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. He went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Genesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages or cities or farms, they made the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might that he might touch them, even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. A little, I'm a little dry here today, but I'm a little weary of having a glass of water. <laughs> so the disciples had come to Jesus and told them all that they had taught and done. And Jesus says, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. Wow, I need this. You need this. We all do. <laughs> this is Sabbath. Now, this is no different than Sunday Sabbath, where we're gathered here today, but this getting away to a quiet place with just you and God, that is Sabbath. Jesus prays some 30-odd times throughout the scriptures, but this is a different. There are four direct instances when he went off alone to pray. Continually, Jesus withdrew from people daily life activities and the demands of his ministry to be alone with the Creator and pray. Jesus' solitude and silence are a major theme in the Gospels. The priority of Jesus' solitude and silence is everywhere, and in the Gospels it is how he began his ministry. Remember, he started by being baptized and going off to the desert. It's how he began his ministry. It's how he made important decisions. It's how he dealt with troubling emotions like grief. It's how he dealt with the constant demands of his ministry and cared for his soul. It's how he taught his disciples. It's how he prepared for important ministry events. It's how he prepared for his death on the cross. Jesus is teaching his disciples his practice. His practice of retreat. These moments of going away to a deserted place in prayer are many little retreats. A time to regroup and reconnect this way so you can do ministry this way. In this instance and through the retreat occurs, in this instance, the retreat actually occurs on water because they didn't get to that deserted place. The only deserted place was on the water. For the crowd followed them around the bank to where they were headed and they are ready for them when they arrive. But this concept of getting away to rest and pray had me thinking about how do we pray? What do we pray for? Sometimes I'm cautious in my words, even up here when it comes to prayer. As a clergy, I'm asked for prayers. I often see people on Facebook who are asking for prayers. I may run into someone somewhere and suddenly they will mention a family member or a friend who does not doing well or is on a job hunt or maybe has lost themselves needs a prayer. And I'll make a promise of prayer, and I often keep it right there on the spot because, well, I'd probably forget otherwise. <laughs> 
But a part of me always wonders just what people are hoping for. What are they expecting? What are we expecting when we ask for prayer? A UCC minister shared this experience. Quote, in July, I had dinner with a longtime friend, also a UCC minister, who retired not long ago. It was wonderful to see him, and it was sad to see him. Since his retirement, he has had significant health issues, some of which seem to be resisting any and all medications. His immediate future, health-wise, is very uncertain. As we parted, not sure when or if we would see each other again, I told him I would hold him in my prayers. But again, what did I mean by that? What exactly will I be praying for? What do I want my prayer for him to accomplish? In fact, is accomplish even the proper word to use, unquote. Every week in our worship service, we lift up joys and concerns during our prayer time. But when we ask for a friend suffering from illness, for a family member stricken with grief, for ourselves as we face a surgery or a situation we fear might overwhelm us, what are we asking for? What do we hope will happen? Ask and it will be given, search and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. You know, the old, seek ye first the kingdom of God. We sing it often. It's lovely when you can get the whole church doing it in three parts in a round. It usually ends up in mass confusion. It's just interesting because oftentimes our prayers are spoken in mass confusion. Wonderful words. They're comforting words. But do we believe them? Do, what do you suppose they mean? Do you recall Huckleberry Finn's experience with prayer? No? Yeah. Miss Watson, she took me in the closet and prayed, but nothing came of it. She told me to pray every day, and whatever I asked for, I would get it. But it weren't so. I tried it. Once I got a fishing line, but no hooks. They weren't any good to me without hooks. I tried for the hooks three or four times, but somehow I couldn't make it work. I think of all the times I have prayed to catch that one big fish. The preacher goes on to share another story of a church member he had shared with him. There was a bar called Drummond's in Mount Vernon, Texas. It began construction on expansion of their building to make it bigger and better and hoping for to grow their business. In response, the local Baptist church started a campaign to block the bar from expanding using everything from petitions to constant prayer. About a week before the bar's grand reopening, a bolt of lightning struck the bar and burnt it to the ground. Afterward, the church folks were rather smug, bragging about the power of prayer. And so angry bar owner proceeded to sue the church on the grounds that the church was ultimately responsible for the destruction of his building through direct actions or indirect means. Needless to say, the church quickly abandoned the power of prayer argument and instead insisted it had absolutely no responsibility for the connection to the destruction of the bar. The judge read carefully through the plaintiff's complaint and the defendant's reply. He then opened the hearing by saying, quote, I don't know how I'm going to decide this, but it appears from the paperwork that what we have here is a bar owner who now believes in the power of prayer and an entire congregation that doesn't. <laughs> what do we believe about the power of prayer? How do we let prayer into our lives? What do we expect when we pray? Another former UCC executive minister, Steve Sterner, once wrote, quote, I think our problem with prayer is not that it works sometimes, but that sometimes it doesn't. We truly struggle with the efficacy of prayer when it doesn't seem to work. It's easily easier to believe totally that prayer does not work than it is to reconcile in our own hearts and minds why it doesn't seem to work sometimes. Ask and it will be given to you sometimes. Seek and maybe you will find. That doesn't sound particularly comfortable, does it? <laughs> Samuel Wells speaks of three different kinds of prayer. The first kind is the resurrection prayer, 
when you're just praying so hard for that miracle, Jesus alive from the dead, Lazarus walks out of the tomb, no matter what all the doctors have said, the lame will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will hear. Can I have just a little of that? This is a prayer that comes from our deepest despair, from the very wells of faith that that mustard seed that we have been told to move a mountain with. Well, Lord, we don't have a mountain to move, but if you could just give us one miraculous cure. This prayer is a prayer that says, God, you have the power to fix it. So fix it. Make changes. Take action. Restore health. I want to pray it. But there are so many times when it is even hard to pray for healing. Or the miracle because healing just isn't going to happen at least not physical healing and not saying miracles aren't possible nor that miracles won't happen miracles are all the time happening all the time even now the simple fact that this bunch of cells can breathe walk talk and think is a miracle but when the resurrection prayer is lifted this is not what is expected nor understood I have been outside the room of a hospital emergency room with a family with a person who has passed, praying as loudly and powerfully as they can for resurrection. And I mean as loudly as they can. I remind them it's good to pray for resurrection, but you don't have to wake the dead. If that miracle is going to happen, it doesn't matter how loud or how strong you pray it. God holds on to miracles for rare and special occasions. More often than not, I find myself praying what Wells calls the prayer of incarnation. It's a call for God to be with your friend or loved one. It's a recognition that Jesus was broken, was desolate, on the brink of death, and this is all part of being human. Part of the deal we signed on the day we were born. Our bodies and our minds are fragile, frail, and sometimes feeble. There is no guarantee that life will be easy, comfortable, fun, or happy. The prayer incarnation says, God and Jesus, you shared our pain, our foolishness, our sheer bad luck. You took on flesh with all its needs and clumsiness and weakness. Visit my friend. Visit my loved one. And give them the patience to endure what lies ahead. Hope for every trying day and companion with them to show them your love. This is a prayer that reminds us that we're not alone. God is walking beside us, sometimes carrying us. For through Christ, God knows deeply what it means to be human, human and companions with us in our journey every day. Beyond this sacred companionship, there is a third type of prayer that Wells describes. And now, this is a prayer of transfiguration, of transformation. This is a prayer that asks God to give us, our friend, our loved one, a vision of the reality within. The reality that lies beneath. The reality that lies beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension. Well says that this is a prayer that in our times of bewilderment and confusion, ask that God might reveal to us a deeper truth to life. A deeper truth to life than we have ever known. Reasons for living beyond what we have ever imagined and an awareness of grace and love that we will never know before, that we have never known before. Well says this prayer is asking just for a glimpse into the mystery. Help us to see, help our mind through this problem, this pain, this trial, to see perhaps just a glimpse of God's glory. Well, says, maybe this is our real prayer for our friends, our loved ones, ourselves, a prayer for God to make this trial and tragedy, this problem and pain, a glimpse of God's glory, a window into God's world. God, let me see your face, sense the mystery in all things, and walk with angels and saints. Bring me closer to you in this crisis than I have ever been. Make this a moment of truth. Touch me, raise me, make me alive like never before. One of my favorite preachers and teachers, Fred Craddock, shares an experience of this type of prayer of transformation. 
He says, quote, when my sister Frida, my only sister, her prepare her service. He says, I found extremely, extremely Before I closed my eyes, I wanted to make sure I was in front of the throne because what I wanted was God on the throne. God the power, God the Almighty. Her relief and for her healing as intensely and sincerely as I could. And I closed with an amen. I lifted my head. He goes on to say, here it is, God the power. Quote, for Fred, the prayer of a miracle became the prayer of transformation, a glimpse into the deeper truth, a new reality. When Jesus says, ask and it will be given you, he does not exactly say that it will be given. And when he says, seek and you will find, he does not exactly say what we will find. We put our conditions on that. We live in a mystery and we seek to touch it, that which we cannot comprehend. Perhaps the hardest part of prayer is just resting in this mystery, giving ourselves up to it, allowing our attempt at control to slip away, learning to allow and rest and be still in the spirit of God, but not only in times of need and despair, but also just for ourselves in daily life. Just to pause in the morning to pause midday, to when you see a moment of freedom, to pause and say, thank you, God, let me see into this mystery that is the gift of life you've given us. You see, in the everyday life of loving community, we need to pause. We need to be alone with God so we have the spirit, the energy, and the wisdom to walk when called, to pray when called, and to seek mystery and allow God to be in control. As C. Sermon says, perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of prayer is surrendering the myth to the mystery of that to which we pray. Now, our prayers may not be answered in the way we wish. May, they may not achieve the results that we hope for. And yes, there will be times when simply we are not okay with that. I'm quite sure that God is okay with those times when we're not okay. But as Craddock discovered, as we are persistent in prayer, it is often we who are transformed. We who are changed. We who begin to see life and reality and God in a whole new light and disarm our demands and our expectations. We just might find ourselves able to welcome the acceptance, love, and other blessings that we didn't even pray for. Now, I have no final answer for you concerning prayer and the power of prayer. But I do want to urge you to trust the process, to pray and pray often. And as we say, sometimes use words, regardless of what comes of it, because the process itself, the prayer itself, is life-giving and a blessing. Amen.